Thank you, Dean. Good morning again, church. If you have your Bibles and want to follow along this morning, our text is going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 17. That's in the Old Testament book of 1 Samuel chapter 17. Uh, I encourage you to be looking in your Bibles along with us uh, in your Bible apps or in your, your Bible in your lap. Either way, be turning to 1 Samuel chapter 17. I'm going to put the scriptures up on the screen for you as well, uh, but I encourage you to be uh, marking up your Bibles as well, highlighting those things, marking certain verses that jump out at you and what they mean. While you're doing that, let's say a word of prayer together. Father, this time I pray that you speak either through me or in spite of me. Let those with ears to hear, hear the word. It's in Christ's name that I pray. Amen. I want to tell you right off the bat, God loves you. He is crazy about you. God is rooting for you. And God does not relish your hardship. If you are struggling right now, I want you to know that he wants you to succeed. He wants you to be one in him. The Lord wants to direct you in paths of righteousness for his name's sake, but also for your sake as well. And so this morning, as we turn to 1 Samuel chapter 17, I want to kind of put it in context a little bit. And then I want to, I want to give you a piece of encouragement and a piece of challenge from God's word this morning. This is early in the years of Israel. And in, in way of context, you have a king who is named King Saul, who is reigning in Israel. And his reign, unfortunately, has been marked by disobedience. He, he always seems to be doing things his way. He kind of is a consistent, inconsistent person. He has his moments, but he can't seem to break free from his disobedience. There is this prophet who has been speaking to him by the name of Samuel, and he himself has gotten frustrated with Saul, and Samuel's kind of given up on Saul, and he has left in terms of he's no longer visiting the royal court with Saul at this point. The whole nation is dealing with an invasion as well. You know, to make things worse, you have this group of Philistines who are gathered on the western front of the nation of Israel. They've pushed into the Hebrews' territory. And so Saul has, at this point, gathered his troops on one side of a valley called the Valley of Elah. On the other side are the troops from Philistia. Let's enter the story in verse 4 of 1 Samuel chapter 17. A champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp. His height was about nine foot six, and he had a bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat of scale of armor of bronze weighing 125 pounds. On his legs, he wore bronze greaves, and a bronze javelin was slung on his back. His spear shaft was like a weaver's rod, and its iron point weighed 15 pounds. His shield bearer went ahead of him. This champion of Philistine, he steps out, and he's stepping out to intimidate all of the soldiers in Israel. Now you see there in the text, I've kind of translated already for you the height there, uh, which is roughly about nine and a half feet tall if you are looking at the original Hebrew. Now we think of, we think of height maybe in, in terms of NBA players. So one of, the, one of the rather tall NBA players that we all have a little familiarity with might be Shaquille O'Neal. So for context, Shaq is seven foot one. And to give you kind of an idea of how tall seven foot one is, here is, here is a picture of Shaq next to five foot four Kevin Hart or or how about that's not a great comparison let's compare him to someone who was truly tall how about we compare him to Robert Wadlow Robert Wadlow is the tallest man in recorded history with irrefutable evidence he was eight foot 11, 8 feet 11, just as shy under 9 feet tall. And just for fun, here's a comparison with Wadlow and Shaq and Kevin Hart. You know, the bottom line is Goliath was inconceivably enormous. And that is, that's intimidating. He is large and he is in charge. He is incredibly intimidating. But the other descriptions are scary too. It talks about the spear that he carries, which is like, you know, a couple of curtain rods in length. It is about two to two and a half inches in width. And it also has a spearhead at the end, which weighs about as much as a good sized bowling ball. And you have this picture of him with, with this sun that's glinting off of this bronze armor. What an incredibly intimidating sight. And it's scary enough just to look at him, but then this giant named Goliath opens his mouth. Look at verse 8. Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine, and are you not the servants of Saul? Choose a man and have him come down to me. If he's able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. 
And look at verse 10. Then the Philistine said, This day I defy the armies of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. So Israel looks down and listens to these threats from this giant. And what's their response? We don't have to wonder. We're actually told. We know what's going on in their hearts and in their minds. Verse 11 says, On hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. You know, so everyone is afraid. Everyone is afraid and terrified. But again, we're focusing on one man this morning, and that man is Saul. So Saul is dismayed and terrified. But listen, Goliath is terrifying. You know, naturally he's terrified. It makes perfect sense to be afraid of that goon who's standing over there, who is incredibly enormous, who is shouting these threats. But here's what's interesting. We're actually... We're actually told something that's kind of ironic about Saul. We only know really two things about his physical description. And one of them is a little ironic. Look at verse 2 of 1 Samuel chapter 9. It says, Kish had a son named Saul, as handsome a young man as could be found anywhere in Israel. And he was a head taller than anyone else. So Saul is handsome and Saul is, is tall, at least compared to everyone else. Well, well, not anymore. Not in comparison to that, that threat over there, that enemy who is a giant who is shouting these threats. And so naturally Saul is terrified. You know, the only way you wouldn't be terrified in this situation is if you had a champion of your own who was, who was maybe larger than Goliath. Well, Israel did. But for some reason, they'd kind of forgotten about him. His name is Jehovah, Almighty God. And you almost want to tap every soldier on the shoulder and you want to say, what about God? What about God? Have you, have you forgotten about God? God is on your side. In fact, one individual shows up and he essentially says just that. You know, David comes to the scene and he hears Goliath's taunts. And his response in verse 26 of 1 Samuel 17 is, Who is this heathen Philistine anyway that he is allowed to defy the armies of the living God? And so David shows up. He's only there because he's delivering lunch to his brothers. And he's like, wait a second, what's the holdup? You're, you're, are you guys serious? You're, you're going to let him talk like this? Who's, who's going to go out there and fight this guy? And this guy's defying the armies of the living God. We can't let this stand. Are you going to do it? Are you going? Well, fine, then I'm going to go do it. And then here's the deal. That's, that's exactly what happens. We know this very famous story where David, who was a boy, takes down the, 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 big, the big Goliath, the big giant. And you say, how or, or why? How'd that happen? Because he was some kind of prodigy warrior or something? No. No, David takes down Goliath simply because God is with him. Goliath may have been enormous, but he was nowhere near the sides of Almighty God. And, and here's the sad part, sad for Saul anyway. You know, Saul is, is there for the whole thing. In fact, he sends David into the fight. He actually says, go and the Lord be with you. He sort of kind of roots him on in this endeavor. But the sad part of the story is that people have been telling this story for literally thousands of years. For thousands of years, we've been telling the story of what? Of David and Goliath. And what's so incredibly sad is it could have been the story of Saul and Goliath. Everything that was true of David could have been true of Saul, but it wasn't meant to be. David's defining moment was sealed by bravery and faith, and it became Saul's defining moment, but it was sealed by fear and failure. And to know why, you have to know a little bit of Saul's track record. Saul had a track record of constantly doing things his own way. Every time God told Saul to do something, he would just sort of brazenly decide for himself what he was going to do. He takes it upon himself to burn an offering when he is specifically told not to. He also keeps some plunder of battle when he's specifically told not to. And in those instances, he lies whenever he's caught. The bottom line is... The bottom line is Saul never taught himself to act in faith. His decision-making came down to what he could quantify and calculate. He, it, was, it was all about what his eyes could see, what his mind could imagine. Saul never seemed to appreciate the Lord's role in events. He never calculated that God would be for him on his side. He never made it a habit of acting in light of the presence of God. Saul made it a habit, in fact, to walk away from God. 
And because of his posture of disobedience and faithlessness and pride, he, he can't even get God to answer him half the time. Even if he mustered the courage somehow, and he ran down into that valley, he would have had every reason to wonder if the Lord was on his side. Why? Because Saul had made it a habit to walk away from the presence of God. Listen, when you step away from God's presence, you step away from God's power. You see, according to the Bible, what breeds courage is God's presence. According to the Bible, courage isn't self-confidence or this kind of daring personal resolve and bravery. Scripture says that courage grows out of a security and sureness of being in the presence of God. In fact, Scripture draws this very distinct connection. Scripture draws this very distinct connection between human courage and God's presence. Those two things are aligned according to the Bible. The Lord tells people over and over again, be courageous, have courage, be courageous. And when we're part of something challenging or difficult or maybe even a little bit frightening, he instills courage through one thing, the assurance of his presence. In fact, when leadership transitioned from Moses to Joshua, what does Moses say in Deuteronomy chapter 31? Verse 6, be strong and courageous, he tells them. Do not be afraid or terrified because of your enemies. But look at this, for the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you or forsake you. Moses says, your courage is enabled by God's presence. And when Moses dies, the Lord once again reminds Joshua of this. In Joshua chapter 1, verse 9, Be strong and courageous, Joshua. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. You know, you may have forgotten, but that boy, David, who ran down into the valley of Elah, he wasn't just a shepherd and he wasn't just a king. He was also a songwriter. And do you remember the most famous words from his most famous song? Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For you are with me. Your presence gives me courage. God's presence does that. It breeds courage. And, and so that, that should leave us wondering, okay, well, where does God's presence come from? How can, I, how can I be assured that God is with me? Well, when you turn the page from the end of Deuteronomy to the beginning of Joshua, you also find this other connection. God's presence breeds uh, courage, and God's presence is tied to obedience. Look at verse 7 of Joshua 1. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Be courageous, God says, and in order to be courageous, you need my presence, but in order to enjoy my presence, you have to do what I say. You must obey my law. He even says, don't turn left, don't turn right. You have to do what I tell you to do. Listen, obey God, and you will enjoy God's presence. And if you enjoy God's presence, you have every reason to be courageous. God's presence breeds courage. And where does God's presence come from? Obedience. Obedience invites the presence of God. You know, Jesus actually alludes to this as well. Jesus said in John 14, verse 21, Whoever has my commands and keeps them, is the one who loves me. And the one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. Do you want Jesus to show up in your life? Then do what he says. Doing what God tells you to do becomes this unshakable foundation for your life. Isn't that what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 7? He says, Therefore, anyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built this house on the rock. He says, The rain came down and the streams rose and the winds blew and beat against that house. And yet it did not fall because it had its foundations on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down and the streams rose and the wind blew and beat against that house and it fell with the great crash. Listen, nobody is exempt from the storms. The faithful and the faithless alike will have 
The storms come. Everyone encounters the storm. The question is, will it shake you? Well, how's your foundation? Will your foundation be strong enough to hold back the wind and the rain? Well, that depends. It depends on your obedience. It depends on you doing what Jesus tells you to do. Jesus says, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice. Are you putting God's words into practice? When you step outside the will of God, when you, like Saul, decide you are the one that's ultimately in charge, you are the one in control, fear reigns where God does not. When God speaks, and we, like Saul, just kind of weigh it. We say, well, I don't know how I feel about that. And and this I might do, but this I might not. I might do that, but I'm going to do it my own way. When we behave like that, we find ourselves like Saul. We find ourselves living a life of fear. So what does it look like to obey God in the midst of our circumstances? And I was thinking about that question this week, and I was thinking about my friend Chad Martin, who he and his family are longtime members here at Pleasant Ridge. And Chad is an ICU nurse at JPS Hospital in Fort Worth. He is literally on the front lines in the fight against the coronavirus. And Chad is not just a nurse, he's also a team leader. He is the team leader for his unit, and there are a lot of people who work in uh, that wing of the hospital who look to him for their charge. And I will say, it is a scary time right now for Chad and for his coworkers. He actually told me that a lot of nurses and other hospital personnel are, well, they're kind of terrified right now. He said that. He said many of them have made the decision to be away from their families. They have separated themselves from their families. Some are living in RVs. Some are just living in a different place their family is. Uh, they're just choosing to live separately because they're so afraid of bringing the virus home to the people they care about. There's a lot of uncertainty, he said. He said protocols are kind of changing every single day. And Chad is doing his best, as he always does, to make sure that everybody is safe. But also he wants to provide a strong and a calm presence on his wing of the hospital, both to his patients and to his coworkers. Is he drained? Yeah, he kind of is. He said physically, emotionally, he's quite drained. He said, I feel a little bit like that duck, you know, that, that is uh, on the surface. He, he looks calm and he looks poised. He looks in control. He said, but I'm paddling away underneath the surface, furiously paddling. But let me tell you what, his coworkers appreciate him for it. They know about his faith in part because he speaks about it at work. He prays with his patients whenever the, uh, whenever the opportunity arises. He points to his faith whenever that is appropriate. But they also know about Chad's faith because they see it in action. And not just right now, but they have seen it. Chad does his best to stay in God's presence, to obey what God would have him to do. And as a result, what does he enjoy? He enjoys God's power and he has great courage. Chad's message, we'll get through this. We'll get through this. That's courage in the face of fear that comes through the presence of God, listening to what he says and doing it. So what about you? How are you obeying what God tells you to do right now? Are you staying in God's word? Are you listening for his voice and doing what he tells you to do when he puts something on your heart, when he points something out in his word and it challenges you to serve in a way or to to put yourself out there in a way? Are you doing that? Are you living by faith? Are you unwavering in your belief that God is in control and that you are not? Is your prayer, Lord, thy will be done. Are you loving and serving the people that God calls you to love and to serve? Are you respecting the authorities? And are you doing what they tell you to do? Are you loving others by staying home for their sake? Are you being patient with your neighbors? Are you checking on them? Are you serving them? Are you trying to be a source of encouragement with every person you come in contact with, either in person or online? Are you doing what God is telling you to do? Or are you like Saul, just kind of making it up as you go along? But when you face Goliath, it's going to make a big difference. Your obedience will instill 
God's presence in your life and God's presence in your life will instill God's courage for your life. Let's pray together. Thank you so much, Lord, for the encouragement of your word. Lord, we want to feel your presence and we know that part of that is doing what you tell us to do. Father, help us to do that. Help us to, to understand very clearly what you call us to do. Help us to live pressed into your presence every day, inviting it in. And, and when we sense that you're calling us to do something, help us to do that in faith. Give us courage this day to face our fears. We pray this in Christ. Amen.